So this is the first time we are actually paying up on our assumption that all the dimensions are independent. And not only that, in doing that, we also figured out that, in fact, the data might actually be looking much larger dimensionality data than it really is. Because remember, this guy's case, original dimensionality is UV, two dimensions. How many dimensions can I make the final data to be look like as? Million dimensions, infinite number of dimensions, because I can make infinite number of combinations of user mix. Even just sticking to linear. And then even more infinite, bigger infinity, you also throw in the nonlinear combinations, which we won't touch right now. He said, you know, you're screwed if you circle, right? Well, you're really screwed, you know, pardon my language, he said this first. Um, <laughs> but but he's really bad, bad, badly off if, in fact, the transformation is nonlinear. Because then the techniques that I'm telling you would not work. The advantage of the techniques that I'm going to tell you is that they are polynomial in the size of the data, which should be happy for most of you, but it's really not happy uh, if, in fact, the data size is humongous. Okay. So while this idea that I'm going to talk about, which is singular value decomposition, related semantic indexing, is a beautiful, beautiful idea, the usual question, as soon as the class is over and I'm trying to walk out, somebody will come and say, is Google doing it? You know, first of all, I have no idea what Google does, okay? <laughs> I have no idea, okay? The question I'm interested in is not what Google does, but what it should be doing. That's what I'm supposed to teach, okay? Um, the second point is that, in fact, it turns out that computing singular value dimension, singular value decomposition, which is a new type of decomposition that some of you, how many of you have already heard of singular value decomposition? You guys are aware, good for you. Okay. Most linear algebra courses, unfortunately, end with eigenvalue decomposition. If you haven't heard about eigenvalue decomposition, I know that you just sleep well during linear algebra classes. But if you haven't heard about singular value decomposition, that only means your math teacher wasn't ambitious enough. That's why I sent you a link to Gilbert Strang's lecture on you know, singular value decomposition. That's very nice, you know. And uh, um, so you should look at it. So computing a singular value decomposition is only cubic in the size of the matrices. Remember, this whole thing is in terms of matrices. It's only cubic in the size of the matrices, which is good for you and me, but not necessarily good if the matrix size is in billions and trillions, which is one of the reasons why people don't necessarily do full-scale dimensional detection. Okay? But theory of it has you know, ramifications to everything else, because you can see everything as just a special case of LSI, for example. Okay? Okay, so. 10 minutes. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I should take a picture of the class before SVD and after SVD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so again, we'll go, as I said, I'm going to use two more classes next week, but you know, this is a good place to start today, and you know, it will give you a weekend to think about um, existential questions, such as what is SVD, why am I doing, what am I doing in this course, etc. Um, so, if SVD is the solution, in the previous case I said singular value decomposition is the solution. If SVD is the solution, what's the problem? Now you might say, well, why do you mean what's the problem? You know, I have a problem and this is SVD. It must be a solution. Mathematicians don't live for you and me. They barely live for their families. Right? They do whatever is worth doing, you know, in their own sense, not because it will be useful for IR. So why the heck were people even doing singular value decomposition in linear algebra? Understanding that is actually quite useful because it's connected to the notion of matrix approximation. Okay, so let me lead you through this and it's a beautiful reason to appreciate all the linear algebra that you learned before. Um, so remember the rank of the matrix. Again, many of these, if you've forgotten, I'm just repeating it, you know, it's all recorded in multiple different formats, listen to it, or, you know, read something else. Um, rank of a matrix is defined as the size of the largest square matrix of this matrix that has non-zero determinant. Do you understand? Because if it's a square matrix, then uh, basically you want to consider the sub-square matrix of that, that has non-zero determinant. Get the largest such sub, uh, sub matrix. And if it's a non square matrix, you can still get square sub matrices of it. What is the size of the largest sub square matrix of this matrix that has non zero determinant? In general, how do you easily get 
rank to be zero for a matrix? Just make linearly dependent, linearly dependent rows or columns. Did you see what I'm saying? So if I have a square matrix which is full rank, that means it's m by m matrix and it has full rank, then I can make it. So here is here is a good way. I, you can get yourself a bad matrix. Right? I mean, you don't need to actually do all the work. So suppose I want to give you a square matrix that's full rank. This is m by m. I want to get a matrix that is subtly not full rank. What do I do? First, I add a column here. Okay? Which is a linear combination of the columns here. Then I add a row here, which is linear combination of the rows here. Big one, down now. Now I'm guaranteed to have determinant equal to zero. So then when I give you this matrix, it's 11 by 11 matrix, but its true dimensionality is only 10 by 10. Its true dimensionality is 10 dimensions. Because this other stuff that I added is essentially dependent. So notice, by the way, I did not mention it earlier, uh, but <laughs> if your rows are documents and columns are terms, then adding a new term is like adding a new column. I'm also adding new documents in some sense. What is that supposed to do? I can take one document in my corpus, add it to another document in my corpus, and make it a new document, and throw it into the corpus. That's what I'm doing. That doesn't change the dimensionality of the corpus. Because the new documents are just linear combinations of the old documents. That's sort of like doubling the document is not supposed to change some things, remember? That's sort of the generalization of that idea. Okay, so rank of a matrix is defined as this, and in some sense, the rank of the matrix is its dimensionality. Okay, my question then is suppose I were to give you, you know, a matrix, you know, which is. Uh, which is basically 100 terms, 5,000 documents. 1,000 documents by 100 terms, DT matrix. Okay? Now, suppose I want to find its rank. Okay, first of all, just sanity check. Um, can the rank of this matrix be 103? That much you should know. Because it could be at most, at most 100, because the biggest square matrix you can make is of size 100. Okay? So suppose the document dimensionality is actually, the rank of this is actually um, 98. So that means the underlying data is only really 98 dimensional data, not 100 dimensional data, which you thought it maximally could be. Okay? Now, I don't really want 98 dimensions. Between you and me, I really want exactly seven dimensions. How can I get a version of this matrix which will only have rank seven? It's a beautiful idea. Okay? So remember that I need to get, of course I can get a seven by seven matrix which has seven dimensions. That's useless. Because then this has no connection to this matrix. I want to reduce the dimensionality while keeping the, duct, the matrix be as close to the old matrix as possible. Okay, so what I really want to do is if this was M, I want to come up with another M, I mean another M dash, and its size should still be 1000 documents by 100 terms. So they're equal size matrices. And if these two matrices are obviously not the same, they have the same dimensions, so I can talk about the distance between them. The distance between you know, vectors can be computed in terms of like you know, vector similarity, for example. What about distance between matrices? There are many ways of computing them. One would be uij minus vij squared. So consider the difference between the corresponding elements between the two matrices, square it, sum all the differences. If the matrices are the same, it will be zero. If the matrices are far enough from each other, it will be larger and larger, away, more and more away from zero. So now I'm getting somewhere. I have this matrix, which is 1,000 by 100 terms. 
I want another matrix, which is also 1,000 by 100 terms, except I want its rank to be 7. And since I'm in the business of being wishful, I also want that matrix that you're giving me a matrix, and I say, no, here's this other matrix, which is also 1,000 by 100, which is also rank 7, but it's closer to my matrix. So you lose. So what I really want you to do is give me a matrix M dash, which is of the same size as the, my old matrix, okay, which has the rank 7, and among all mat matrices of these dimensions and rank 7, this is the closest matrix. Now, if you are a programmer and never were forced to take any classes in math, what would you do? Write a loop for finding all the matrices of a certain size and then give it to your, you know, <laughs> manager and say, yes, this is a nice loop, it will be done, you know, before the universe ends and then, you know, <laughs> and, you know I would have gotten my paycheck. This is a beautiful optimization problem. You have infinite number of matrices of rank 7. Among those, I want the matrix that is the closest to this. And this is where, you know, remember the, the whole point of uh, uh, calculus is to find optimization, right? And this basically, if you were to use uh, calculus of variations, it turns out that the optimum is connected. The optimum solution for this problem is connected to singular value decomposition. Okay, and singular value decomposition is defined it's sort of like eigenvalue decomposition. We'll get back into the details next class, but you can read this slide, won't stop you. Um, and basically, it's also defined for the, it's defined also for the non-square matrices. It's defined for everything. And it's the way it is, is, um, you know, if I give a matrix M, I would, so if I, the singular value decomposition of a matrix DT, matrices dd i'm sorry df times fd and ff times df prime okay so that means df times ff will be still a df df times df prime could be dt matrix back at least dimensional wise it's working out okay so i will give you these three matrices it turns out df and df would be orthomorphic matrices. That means their columns are orthogonal to each other. That means they are actually orthonormal bases. Okay? So this and this are orthonormal, and this is a diagonal matrix. This is zero, this is zero. And it turns out the numbers here are basically lambda 1 square, lambda 2 square, etc. lambda 2 square. I'm sorry, no, um, it should be, what it should be is, it should be is S1, S2, etc. SK, where S1, SI is positive square root, positive square root of the eigenvalues of the i eigenvalue of d d r d d matrix. So if I give you d t matrix, I multiply d t by d d, I'll get d d matrix. If I multiply d t dash by d d matrix, I'll get d d matrix. Right? Both of them are going to be square symmetric matrices. So if you were to do eigen decomposition on them, you will get real valued eigenvalues. In some sense, those are the eigenvalues for this matrix except for the square of the matrix because you multiply the matrix by itself, dt by itself. So you take the positive square. That's what your eigen decomposition is and these play the same role as the eigenvalues. So if you were to ask for k-dimensional reduction, I just make this particular last k guys, last n minus k guys zero. And do the multiplication. I'll still get matrix of exactly the same size as the original <coughs> matrix. And I just tell you, this is the best matrix of the rank k <coughs> that you can ever get in terms of its distance to the matrix that you have. 
Okay, I will, for those of you who are interested enough, I will send you a write-up which shows that the solution for the optimization problem we talked about is actually SVD, but that requires background in calculus and variations. So suffice it to say that won't be on winter. But you need to know what is the problem you just solved. Even if your uncle helped you solve it, okay, uh, in the mathematics department, very poorly paid uncle, to me, you know, to say multiple times. Mathematicians don't get any pay. You, know, you guys, you know, who write, you know, infinitely long programs, infinitely easy <laughs> programs, get much better pay than people who actually come up with this sort of stuff. But you should know what did they actually solve? What did we ask them to solve? That's what we are basically doing. And next class, we'll come back and essentially do this SVD. And that's related to my